things are getting much more challenging, but there's hope. That's true of the U.S.-China relationship. It is even more true of the topic that we're going to be addressing over the course of the next 50 minutes, uh, global climate, a town hall getting to zero. Uh, and to be very clear, uh, we're not getting to zero, but um, a climate town hall that says getting to something that we feel like we can live with on the planet felt a little too long, so we decided to go with getting to zero. It's an existential threat for us, but I have to say, and I have to give an enormous amount of credit, not just to the organizers, but also to the Chinese government, that the amount of direction and stagecraft that I've gotten and things that I can and can't talk about is exactly zero, which means I won't be invited back to do this next year, but it, it also means that it's an area that the Chinese and indeed that all of us understand we need to be honest about because we require global cooperation and we require action. So that's what we're going to discuss over the course of the next 50 minutes with two panels, but also with a remarkable interactive tool. We're not just going to talk theoretically about where global climate is going, but as we discuss the issues, we also have a friend, Professor John Sturman uh, at MIT and Climate Interactive, um, and he's going to walk us through a model that actually shows the impact of various policy levers we can pull on global climate. John, can I invite you to the stage, please? Thank you, Ian. So, John, show us your model. Show us how it works. Great. So, uh, we need to bring it up on the screen. There it is. We call it En-ROADS. And let me tell you why we've been developing these interactive climate policy simulations. It's because research shows that showing people research doesn't work. I know you've all been through those briefings where you see a million PowerPoint slides and nothing happens. So today you're going to have a chance, and Ian's going to have a chance to save our climate. Right now you see on the left side primary energy use, historic data from 2000 till now, and then projection based on standard assumptions out to 2100 with coal in brown, oil in red, natural gas in blue, renewables here in green, biomass and nuclear power on top. And that pattern of growth in primary energy leads to these emissions of greenhouse gases from forestry in green, fossil fuels in gray, fluorinated gases, methane in blue, and nitrous oxide. And that leads us to the catastrophic level of warming by 2100 of over 4 degrees C. This is not compatible with prosperity or health or civilization. And what we're going to do now is give you all a chance through Ian to see if we can bring that level of warming expected down towards 2 and striving for 1.5 as in the Paris Accord. Ian, what would so, you like to try? So at 4.1, obviously, we're long Beijing, but we're really short Shanghai and Shenzhen, right? Um, and so we really don't want uh, to be there. Uh, let's throw, to start us off before we get the panel, out um, a couple of things that are already very much in the policy discussion. First, with the exception of my government in the United States, almost everyone out there recognizes that we need to move on coal. So first, why don't we actually uh, move coal production down? Great. So there's multiple ways to do that. I'll click on the coal button and let's try something that Mr. Bloomberg is actively campaigning for. We'll stop the construction of all new coal infrastructure in the year 2025. Watch what happens here. It makes a big difference. We have to keep the fossil carbon in the ground. So by stopping the construction of all new coal infrastructure, Coal production peaks not in 2025, but later because of the existing fleet of coal infrastructure. And then it declines, and we're getting more renewables, a little bit more gas, and a little bit more nuclear to fill the gap. So we're not increasing energy poverty. That took us down five-tenths of a degree C. That's a big impact. Keep the fossil carbon in the ground. Okay, let's go to another one. Um, nuclear power. Great. Uh, so we can certainly increase that. We absolutely can. We're As already we are getting China. some. Let's subsidize nuclear power pretty aggressively. You can see that blue wedge gets much bigger. But what happened to the temperature? Basically nothing. 
So you're basically saying nuclear power, despite the subsidies, isn't moving the outcome. Why is that? So uh, watch what happens here when we subsidize nuclear. No subsidy, subsidize. You do, in fact, get a lot more nuclear, but what's happening to the green wedge of your other renewables, your wind, solar, geothermal, and the storage to go with them? You're squeezing them out. Standard basic economics. You're making nuclear more affordable. Utilities will stop investing in those other renewables. Not much net change in emissions. So one more policy input before we bring out of the panel. We have Bill Gates coming on after this. So I feel like we should talk about the, the impact of new technology breakthroughs on energy. Great. So new technology here means we're going to assume a radical new technological breakthrough that gives us 100% carbon-free energy with no uh, side effects, and it's going to be as cheap as coal. And the breakthrough, oops, the breakthrough comes very soon, 2025. This would be like we had fusion in 2025. No fusion advocate believes that's possible. But you can see it didn't change the temperature very much. Well, maybe the breakthrough just isn't big enough. Let's make it a huge breakthrough. The breakthrough is today, and it's cheaper than coal and gets cheaper over time with learning and scale. You still only get a tenth of a degree of benefit. And, and the reason why that hasn't moved the needle is what? So there's three reasons. First of all, it takes a long time, even if the breakthrough is today in the lab, a long time to bring it to commercial feasibility and then scale it up long delays, and in the meantime, you keep burning fossil fuel and harming the climate. The second thing is, you've really squeezed out the renewables further and the nuclear, so the substitution effect is offsetting the benefits of your new technology. And the third thing is, in order for the market to take it at a high rate, it has to be cheaper than coal. But if it's cheaper than coal, you're lowering energy prices, and that leads to a rebound effect. Look at the top line here. If we take out the new tech, you get an increase in primary energy demand. So the rebound effect, the long delays, and the substitution effect limit the benefits even of this magical technical breakthrough today. <laughs>